A firm's value is determined by many factors, some familiar and well-known, but others, which although unseen, have massive influence. Consider, for example, a company's physical assets, intellectual property or even its brand name. These can be readily evaluated since they are visible. One can inspect a business's premises, giving assurance that tangible assets exist. Products incorporating intellectual property can be compared with a competitor's, thus verifying the viability of a firm's offerings. Even brand names can be assessed for recognition and market influence, with value approximated accordingly. However, a business's capital structure, one of the most important factors driving the value of a firm, is invisible, impossible to review by a simple physical inspection. But how important is a firm's capital structure? Well, when a leverage buyout occurs, very important. Let's look briefly at what many consider the first leveraged buyout. This took place in 1955, when McLean Industries borrowed heavily to acquire Waterman Steamship Corporation. After the deal was completed, the investors, who now controlled the combined entity, were able to use Waterman's own cash and assets to pay off the loans used to acquire the company. McLean, having eliminated a competitor, went on to achieve a dominant position in the industry, later commercialising the concept of container shipping. This singular event gave rise to a wave of similar actions where publicly traded entities were used to acquire other businesses. These deals, widely publicised, seem foolproof. Undervalued companies are acquired, restructured, then either integrated into the acquirer or sold on. What could possibly go wrong? It turns out plenty. Consider an LBO that failed Robert Campo's late 1980 takeover of Federated Department Stores. Federated Department Stores, now known as Macy's, was founded in 1929 in Ohio. Successful in the American Midwest, management focused on a relatively small but very lucrative niche, high-end retail. Because of management's strategic focus, Federated ran a relatively small number of stores when compared to other American retailers like Sears or Kmart. Financier Robert Campo thought the value of Federated would be significantly increased if the firm expanded nationwide. Federated's management, citing their company's long history of success throughout the business cycle, disagreed with the minority shareholder. Campo began to acquire stock and then announced a tender offer for remaining shares at an almost 100% premium to market. Management denounced the hostile takeover. However, in 1989, Campo succeeded in gaining control. He then sought to recoup his acquisition costs by issuing a massive amount of debt, which increased Federated's gearing ratio, or leverage. Leverage is both nation and industry specific. For example, at the time US banks were, on average, employing leverage ratios of roughly 10 to 1, while American manufacturing entities were operating with leverage generally not greater than 1 to 1. After the LBO, Federated's leverage had increased from almost zero to 30 to 1, or the capital structure showed $30 of borrowed money for every dollar of shareholder equity. Campo's tactics left Federated with almost $7 billion of debt. But was this really a problem? Campo was no doubt aware of the Modigliani and Miller capital structure irrelevance theory, which tells us businesses' returns are unaffected by the financing decision. Further, in America, interest payments provide a tax shield which should serve to increase the value of the firm as the cost of debt is effectively much lower than the cost of equity financing. These factors, combined with Federated's upscale image, Campos' cost-cutting and rapid expansion, should have proved successful. But what he had failed to anticipate was a softening retail environment as the business cycle turned. Campos' profit forecasts of $740 million proved widely optimistic and in fact federated 
reporting a loss of almost $200 million, was unable to service debt. In 1990, Federated Department Stores was bankrupt and Campo was out. Creditors had seized control of the venerable retailer and shareholders' equity was eliminated. <laughs>